So, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Chris Weisbeck. I'm the Executive Director for Admissions Outreach and Recruitment, as well as the Athletic Liaison at Western New England. I also have Jasmine Rodriguez here. Uh, she's one of our new admissions counselors that just started uh, four days ago. Yeah. Four days ago. She's also a Holyoke High School alum, so in a Western New England grad. So uh, I may have her talk a little bit about her experience, too, uh, as far as the transition from Holyoke to Western New England and everything else. So now... If any of you decide to apply, so we got mo we got a couple seniors, so um, we got three seniors, and the rest of you guys are juniors. So I don't think much is going to change for next year. So everything I'm about to go over will be relatively the same. So if any of you decide to submit, <laughs> I love you, just like remember. If any of you guys decide to uh, submit your application, I am the person that makes the decision whether or not you get in. So you can like me, hate me, we'll find out if you get in or not. So, uh, but one of the things is I'm very, very transparent through this process. I like to let students know exactly how things work, what you need to do in order to be admitted. Because in the end, that's truly our goal. Our goal is to try to figure out how do we accept you, all right? I hate denying students, um, so that's why I'm very transparent, but I also like the communication too and everything else. Now, just by a show of hands, how many of you have actually had an official visit of the campus? All right, I could hear crickets. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's not a bad thing. So what I gave you is a bigger brochure, which you're going to actually see here. So it has a list of our fall open house dates. So we are going to have one in the spring. We do have one coming up on Sunday. So you guys want to do something on Sunday. It's supposed to be a little cold. You may, may not want to be outside. You want to come visit. Uh, you can walk in if you want. Um, we do have advanced registration too. Uh, those Saturday dates, those eight, eight dates that are also listed there are for Saturdays. But we are open Monday through Friday. All right. So uh, we do have some virtual stuff, but all our stuff is really in person. All right. Because... The virtual doesn't really work a lot of times, so I always tell students the only way you're really going to know whether you see yourself there is actually coming to campus and actually visiting. All right. For those that are juniors right now, we will be open over the summer as well. So you guys got a, a lot of opportunities. Now, some of you may have visited the campus as like a group or whatever. I've had a lot of my local students who said, well, I've been on campus or I live nearby. Like, it's not the same. Definitely schedule, especially for you guys like engineering, like you want to get a tour of the labs. You want to see what you're actually going to be doing with the program. All right. Now, normally during this time, I usually talk a lot about the university and then I talk about the admissions process. But I feel like with timing, I'm going to focus a lot more on the admissions process at this point, uh, just because I really want, especially you guys that are seniors, really know what you need to do. Um, but before I do any of that, do any of you guys have any questions whatsoever? Anything you held deep down inside you couldn't wait to ask? No? If something does come up, please stop me. All right. I like the engagement. Having a bunch of eyes just look at me makes me feel uncomfortable. So I really do like the engagement. So that's something to keep in mind. So if something like sparks your memory, just raise your hand and say, hey, can you tell me about this? I don't care what it is. The more questions you ask, I'm telling you, it's going to help out. Yes. Say that one more time. Yes. So right now, it's not really kind of going on right now because of a pandemic still. So. But with the abroad program, and it's one of those things I recommend students do. As a Western World grad myself, mm -hmm. that's one of the things I regret not doing okay. was be able to study abroad. And uh, I know for me, though, is I was terrified to get on a plane. Now my job <laughs> requires me to get on a plane. So um, you have two different options, though. All right? So you have the semester abroad, which usually you'll do either your sophomore or junior year. All right? Now, is there a specific country you had in mind? Uh, no. No, that's all right. Uh, yeah. I just usually ask because I have had some, like, for me, it was like Ireland. Like, I... Still can't wait to go. I've had a lot of people say England. But we've had students study all over the place, all over the globe. Um, as long as you work with our third-party provider, we want to make sure that wherever you decide to study, that A, the credits will transfer, uh, that it's safe, all right, and that there's housing. So those are the three criteria that we need, need to meet. And especially if you work with our third-party provider, then all your financial aid, everything that takes in, uh, into place um, will be the same. It shouldn't change. It shouldn't change, Okay. Now, that's one option. The second option is actually a little bit more popular. So this is where students spend abroad about three weeks over the summer. Uh, so you'll have a cultures class, so everyone's required to take a cultures class. Now, not all of them will have a study abroad option, all right? But some of them do. Like, for example, we will be starting again this summer in Italy. So that's the popular one that a lot of our students go to. So your fall, uh, spring semester, your freshman, sophomore, junior year, um, you'll have this cultures class, and then you cap it off with that three-week trip. So we've done Italy, Greece... Turkey, Morocco, South Africa, uh, Guatemala, China. Cuba, Brazil, China. Brazil, China. Um, we also did Iceland, so criminal justice majors. So they actually took a bunch of criminal justice majors over to Iceland to study gang activity in Iceland. Didn't even know they had gangs in Iceland. So, <laughs> um, but they did that two years in a row. So those options are definitely available. So good question. See, look at that. Now they're all there studying. Go. go ahead. So, so I don't want to say, this goes for everyone. 
The culture's class, yeah. Depending on the culture's class. Mm -hmm. So, like, some of them don't have, because we have some students who don't want to do the study abroad. Like, I took Japan as my culture's class. I didn't study abroad, but we, we learned about the culture of uh, Japan and the Japanese culture and everything else. So, but it is a requirement for all majors within that four years to take that class. So, if you want to take a freshman year or senior, that's your choice. That is your choice. But some of them do have that, that study abroad component to the culture's class. So there's usually an additional charge because of the plane ticket. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, they used to not charge, but then we had a lot of students that we, we would pay for the plane ticket, and the student would back out, and that cost a lot of money. So now we leave it up to students like that, because now we can't afford losing that money <laughs> anymore. So, But it is an option. It is an option. Like I said, if you have the opportunity to do it, I usually recommend it. What other question? Well, just to go a little over the stats, too. Just uh, You guys know where we're located. We're located in, uh, in the... Uh, 16 acres area of Springfield, so we're about right about literally five minutes from East Long Meadow, Wilbraham, so we're about 15 minutes away from downtown. 215 acre campus, so we have about 2,600 full time undergraduate students. If you count our graduate programs, which is like the law school, pharmacy, doctor programs, we're about 3,800 total students. So about 30% of our student population is graduate, 70% is undergrad. Okay. Now you're looking at average classroom size about 18. Now as a freshman. You may get the occasional 30-35. Those are the basic core classes, the ones you don't want to take, but you have to, like English and math. Um, for my criminal justice majors, you may get up to 40 for intro to criminal justice because that is our most popular program. In fact, we just set a school record on the number of students that came in this fall in that program, so we can talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, student factor ratio, you're looking at eight, uh, 12 to 1. Now, majority of our students do come from out of state, so we got about 52% from out of Massachusetts. Uh, we are not a community school. About 70% of our students live on campus, but I can tell you out of the 30% that commute, only like close to 20% truly commute because the others are students who decide to live off campus, uh, but we have to label them as commuters. Now, big transparency. You're going to hear that we have a residency requirement where students have to live on campus for the first two years. However, you're exempt from it because right, you live within 50 miles from campus. So you get to choose whether or not you want to commute or live on campus. But a student from, like, say, New Jersey, they have to live on campus for the first two years. So that's why, because I had a lot of my local students who usually panic when they're like, oh, I, I don't want to live on campus, I want to commute. But you're, you're exempt from it. You're, you're not, you don't fall under the residency requirement. So any questions about that real quick? All right, let's talk about the admissions process. So for my seniors, have any of you guys submitted an application yet? No, okay. Not a bad thing, but this is why I'm glad you're here, all right? So we have two different processes. We have early action, which many of you know is not binding. It's not early decision. You just apply by a certain deadline, and then you usually will hear back at a certain time frame. And then we have rolling admissions. So after November 1st is where we review applications on an ongoing basis. Now, I will be doing, I'll be one of the ones doing the virtual uh, MCAC Instant Decision Day. I think I'm doing one day, and someone else is helping me on the other day. Um, I would recommend getting your application in before then, and more specifically, get it in before November 1st. So if you have your application submitted before November 1st, and it just needs to be submitted, it doesn't need to be complete, so transcripts, test score, anything else can come later. You can send it two months later if you really want. But if you have your application submitted by November 1st, that's going to make you eligible for an early action scholarship. So that's an easy $2,000 per year just to have it submitted, all right? I'm mentioning this now because especially you three that are seniors, I don't want your parents to call me and say, well, I didn't know about it. This is why I have you fill out the cards. They're going to say, no, they didn't know about it because I mentioned it. So, so it's an easy $2,000 per year just to get your application. And then for you guys that are juniors, we don't foresee that we're going to change that. So it's probably going to be the same thing next year. Um, you won't be able to submit your application until after August 1st, though. All right, so anytime between after August 1st and November 1st, you can submit your application at that point in time. Now, with our early action, for most schools out there, though, when you apply by like November 1st or November 15th, they'll usually let you know like a month or two months later. We approach our early action a little bit differently, all right? So if I have like, um, let's say Dan or Dan, you like Danny, Dan, my brother's named Dan, so I just call him Dan, but I'll call you Dan. So, <laughs> so let's say um, you have your application and they're like, you're really excited. I'm like, I'm going to submit my application this week and I'll have everything to Chris on Monday, all right? With most of the action schools, like you'll hear back usually after the deadline, but if you're a clear accept, why am I going to have you wait, all right? I'll get your decision out right away. 
All right. And for you guys to be down here, I do keep track of students who I've met because if I have a list of students that are in my queue to review the application, I have no clue who they are, but I have record that you came down here, you go right on top. I literally can get your application done in 24, 40 hours. We actually were at a visit yesterday and the student had her application and all I needed was her transcript. She had it right in front of her, like email that to me. Later that night, I reviewed her application. She got checked her status page this morning. She knew she was accepted. I got it out because why? I don't want you to wait. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of students get stressed out and they're overwhelmed because it's the waiting, it's the anticipation. So, but why am I going to have you put that? Plus, I'm all, all about having students have as much time as possible to make the best decision for themselves. All right. So that's just something I'm throwing out there in case you guys are interested. <laughs> so um, if you'd rather wait until the MCAC day, that is entirely up to you. And for those that are juniors, that's the Massachusetts College Application Celebration through Gear Up. So that's where we actually will come and I can basically let you know right on the spot whether you're going to be accepted and how much merit money you're going to have right on the spot. So that's, but now it's virtual this year. I think it's virtual. So, um, but that gives you something to look into. Now, there's two different applications you can use. One is the common application, which no pun intended is more common. Those that are, you guys that are juniors right now, you may not have heard the common app. It's basically a generic application. You fill out one, it's supposed to get sent out to all the schools that you're interested in that accepted. Um, we do have our own application as well. I don't have a preference of which one I get. I look at it this way if you're interested, as long as I see something. I don't care which way we go. Now, there is a $40 application fee attached to it. However, there are ways to get it waived. If you are interested in applying, you're going to get my business card at the end. All you have to do is email me. Say, hey, Chris, I'm thinking about applying. All right, you mentioned about a fee waiver. Then I'll give it to you. I just don't want to hand it out like candy right now because I feel like a lot of schools are doing that because they really want to beef up their application pool. And that's not what I'm about. I really want to make sure I find someone that's truly, truly interested in Western New England. Okay? So if you do decide to take part of the MCAC day, I waive the application fee automatically during that time. So you don't have to worry about it. Okay? That's the first of four requirements. The second, which I say is the most important part of the entire application process, is the uh, transcript. All right? How you're doing inside the classroom is really going to allow me to know whether or not you're going to be successful at the institution. Now, our average GPA for the university, so this is in general, it's not major specific, it's a 3.54, all right? Now, I just start some, yeah, see, I see the eyes. <laughs> Keep in mind, that's an average. We accept above it and below it. It is not the minimum, all right? That's why sometimes I get a little nervous about saying what it is. Yo, I see hand, I see hand. Come on. Um, no. no, go ahead, come on. So the, well, the, yeah, so the, it's, it's what are enrolled students, the average GPA is. So, because that's why we've accepted students with like three, three, three O's, two, seven, it all depends on the major. There's a lot of other, like when I say we literally look at every student on a case-by-case -case basis, we do. Plus, whatever GPA shows up on your transcript, that's not the GPA that I'm going to use. I'm actually going to sit down and recalculate it. I'm going to figure out a brand new one. And I'm only going to look at your five major college prep courses, English, math, science, social science, and language of Harvard. Only courses I'm looking at. So music, gym, art, home ec, that goes out the window. We don't even look at it. And trust me, I, I was the one that loved gym class, and if they had AP gym and everything else, I would have taken it. So it doesn't even get factored in there. <laughs> all right? Now, just by a show of hands, and you do not have to raise your hand if you do not fall into this category, but have any of you guys taken any honors, AP, or dual enrollment? Oh, majority. All right. So this is where the recalculation can come into your, uh, into your benefit. So, Kathy, I'm going to pick on you right now. So what was the honors AP course you took last year? Um, I took Spanish honors, and I took English honors, and I took honors. Oh, no, this is good. This is good. So, all right, for Spanish honors, worst case scenario, what was your final grade? Yeah, let's take that. I like this. You're going to like this, all right? So we're going to take that C minus, and we're going to, curve it to, uh, we're going to convert it to our 4.0 scale. So that's a 1.7, but I'm going to acknowledge you're taking a more rigorous class. So that becomes a B minus, becomes a 2.7. All right. If you had, let's say, a B in a class, to us it's an A. Well, let's say you had an A in an honors or AP class, which is a 4.0, becomes a 5.0 out of a 4.0 scale. So that's why most likely, with all those honors classes you took last year, most likely, especially if you took them freshman and sophomore year, you're going to see that GPA actually rise. So, and it's going to be that GPA that I'm going to use, not only to determine whether you're acceptable, but merit money as well. Now, if you have any AP classes, a three or higher will get you some kind of credit. However, depending on what class it is, 
what score you get, what major you apply for, that's going to determine whether it will be transferable. So a couple examples, if you're thinking AP English, AP Psych, AP Cov, three or higher, that's going to transfer it, all right, regardless of the major. But then you have some other ones like AP Calc, all right? With AP Calc, if you get a three, that counts for Calc 123, which is like a business calc. So for criminal justice, health studies, um, business, like political science, that's going to transfer in. But for engineering, it won't because you guys need a four or five. So that's why it all depends on the program. So what I always tell students is if you have a three or higher, submit the AP scores. We'll see about placing the credits because what happens if you change your mind? Like if one of you guys change out of engineering, and let's say business, well, now that course can potentially transfer in. So this way we can always see about placing the credits. And, and honestly, and we were talking about, Aaron and I were just talking about it too, like for many of you guys, especially you guys that are juniors, like, yeah, you might have an idea of what major you want, but you could change your mind. I mean, try and tell a 17, 18-year-old, hey, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? Like, did I go to Western New England become an admissions counselor? No. I went to go into the sports industry, spent one season, and then I went into the corporate world and I came back here. Life took a turn. And then I found my passion. I've been doing it for 17 years later, and they still can't get rid of me. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to make that hurt. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's all about what, you, like, what you're passionate about and everything else. Now, how many of you are doing a like, dual enrollment with HCC or anything like that? All right. Because I always say, if you have the opportunity to do it, do it, highly, highly, highly recommend it. I always get the question from students, especially those that are juniors right now, because I know for seniors, you pretty much have your, like, your schedule already planned. Like, what's better, AP or dual enrollment? Mm -hmm. Hands down, dual enrollment. Here's the reason why. AP, I feel like they make the courses a little bit more rigorous than what they really do, even though they tell you that that's how the, the college is going to be like. No. Dual enrollment, that gives you more an idea of what college is really going to be like. And not only that, the dual enrollment credits transfer in so much easier than AP, all right? Jasmine, how many credits did you come in with? I don't even, I was able to transfer in almost like a semester and a half. Yeah, she graduated a year early. For dual enrollment. So that can save you money in the long run. I have a student, actually, was it from Holyoke here? I can't remember, it might have been two years ago last year, where they got their associate's degree mm -hmm. while they were in high school. So they came in with over 60 credits. They're junior standing, mm -hmm. and they had two and a half years. They were done. Mm -hmm. Like, they only have one year left after this semester, so spring and fall semester. So that's why even those that are seniors right now, maybe you might want to attend, uh, uh, entertain taking, like, a class or two over the summer before coming into college. Like, feel free to. That's going to that's gonna potentially save you money in the long run. All right? All you have to do is get us the official transcript from that college or university, and then we can see about placing the credits. All right? Now, this is where things are going to be a little bit different, though, because depending on what major you are, there are certain classes I need to see from you in order for me to admit you. So even if you're a 4.0 perfect SATs, if you're looking at engineering, like, I need to see certain courses without them, then we have to look at other alternatives, whether it's doing a provisional acceptance or whether it's um, saying, no, we can't admit you into that program and move you into another program, all right? Um, and for juniors, like, this is really going to help you as far as deciding, like, when you're planning your senior schedule. So for my engineers... Sorry, you guys are going to get picked on because you guys have a little bit more of a challenging career. <laughs> so four years of English, which all of you guys need to take anyway. You can't graduate high school unless you have it. Four years of math, at least up to pre-calc. All right, if you're taking calculus, that's even better. But you only need up to pre-calculus for admissions. You must have two lab sciences. One has to be chemistry or physics. If you have both, that's even better. And then U.S. history. Now, the languages. This is a big question I always get from students is how many years of a language you need to take. Do you guys want to guess? Two? Know that you don't know and know that you... I have no idea. All right. <laughs> for us, zero. <laughs> See, better and better for... So we do not have a language requirement. So whether you have one year or four years, uh, we can still admit you to university. Now, keep in mind, though, if you have a language, it is taken in consideration, though, mm -hmm. all right, because it is considered college prep. But, like, I know for, like, for engineering, like, we're going to focus a lot more on your math and science, whereas criminal justice is going to be more of the English and social sciences. So it's very, very different of, of where we're looking for. Now... For my for business, yeah, because I had a couple potential business. Um, yeah, so bu potentially business. Um, four years of English, three years of math, up to algebra two, with the recommended fourth year. That fourth year could be anything. Yep. So is it top to five years as well? Say that one more time. Top to five. Yes. So like, let's say you were. Yeah. So let's say you look at marketing. All right. I always recommend because you had algebra two last year. Yeah, see, this is perfect because it, it's not one of those things where I say you have to have pre-calc. I should get back here, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I move around. Um, you don't have to have pre-calc. Stats for business I like 
because you have to take statistics uh, statistics in college anyway. So, but I know students who take the senior year off and they have the interest in business tend to struggle a little bit more. That transition's a little bit different. So, but you only need up to the algebra two for admissions. And then one lab science and then U.S. history, all right? Uh, for the political science, oh, actually health studies. Let's, Aaron, let's say you go health studies or biology or something towards that. Because we do have some students that will go biology and then try to do the pre-vet, but hands down, I'm just going to tell you, it might not be the best option. <laughs> so, but for you, it's going to be four years of English, three years of math to up to algebra two, because for health studies majors, we do not require you to take calculus in the fall. You do pre-calc. Same thing with biology, but you must have biology and chemistry. You have that both and then U.S. history. Now, for the rest of you guys, criminal justice, uh, political science, um, for you guys, it's going to be four years of English, two years of math up to geometry. So if you hate math, this could come into your benefit. All right, I've accepted students with this. is getting better and better for you. <laughs> so see I, how transparent I am? So, um, now, granted, if you're taking more than geometry, that's to your benefit. But I've accepted students with about a C average in those programs only because you're not looking at a math orange field. It's not like engineering. It's not like business. So there is a little bit of that flexibility. Now, granted, if you're pulling D's across the board, then regardless, of, like, if that's not going to work. So, but that's not where the heavy focus is on. Yep? So I was thinking in the future, I'm not sure, like, what state exactly mm -hmm. what And that's okay. Like, does it apply to, like, every career? Yeah, so, like, if you're looking at criminal justice, but you're not sure one of the concentrations, same requirements. I like to call the non-math, non-science majors. So any of the criminal justice, political science, communications, English, American studies, any of those programs will all be under the same requirement. So it'll be the same thing. And, and, and you only need one last science in U.S. history. So now there is something a little bit special at the end I'm going to mention in regards to scholarship for those programs. So you might, I think you're going to like it even more. <laughs> so, um, but those are the requirements that we need to see for each program. Any questions about that? You guys doing it? Yes. So mm -hmm. let's talk about the merit scholarships, all right? So regardless of which program you apply for, all right, everyone's going to be taken into consideration for a merit scholarship. And you will find out the same day of an acceptance letter how much merit money you're going to receive, okay? They range anywhere from $12,000 to $24,000 per year. Now, our tuition fees, if you commute, it's about $40,000. You get twenty four, you're already halfway there, and we haven't even bought financial aid in. That also does include the $2,000 early action scholarship. So you can get as high as 26. I mean, I have some students that are right now getting up to 30 in total merit, not even financial aid yet, total merit, and they only have about 10, 11 grand to pay. So if they get the loan, they're under $5,000. We're cheaper than a state school. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on how you're doing academically, all right? And that scholarship, you'll be able to keep all four years as long as you remain in good academic standing. What that means is you're not failing out. You stay above a 2.0, you get to keep it. You fall below a 2.0, you're going to lose your scholarship. You're going to be academically suspended, and mom and dad are not going to be happy with you. Worry about number three. <laughs> so, um, but that's the, that's that. And like I said, that other part is the merit-based scholarship, too, is the early action. Have any of you guys been involved with the FIRST organization, like FIRST Robotics, FIRST LEGO? Okay, we'll skip that. The other part, political science and criminal justice majors, all right? If I accept you into those programs, and for those that are juniors, we haven't finalized next year, but I don't foresee us discontinuing this. So it's mainly for, for the um, seniors right now. But if we accept you <coughs> into one of those programs, you automatically get our social justice grant. So it will be an additional $3,000 on top of the other stuff. So right now for juniors, like you really want to make sure you do well junior year and who knows senior year because that can help with your merit. Not just for Western New England, like other schools, that the merit money will be great, all right? Because that you're going to get regardless of your financial aid, financial background too. So, but that's and, and as far as the need based aid, the only form we need. Oh, I've got to go over this in my school. Uh, the need based aid is the FAFSA form. It's the free application for federal student aid. That's the only form we need. Now you guys can't fill it out now, but seniors. You can fill it out at this point. Like even if you haven't applied to Western New England, fill it out. All right. You may hear some schools require a CSS profile. We do not require that. We don't believe you should pay money to tell you're going to get less money. All right. I think it's like eighty dollars. And in my opinion, I think the question is a little intrusive. And guess who owns it? College Board. So huh? you guys have how they're doing their money, SATs, APs, and everything else. So, um, so that's the financial aid, and we start mailing those out around December. And that's where you could potentially be eligible for other need-based aid as far as grants, scholarship, and loans. The other part for the other seniors right now, all right, how many of you guys heard of the Community Foundation of Western Mass? 
See, I'm not surprised. They offer so much money in scholarships, and much of it goes unused because no one knows about it. And January 1st of your senior year, they're going to open up the application. You fill out one application, and it puts your name into a bunch of different scholarships. You have nothing to lose. And I always tell students when it comes to the scholarships, like apply for everything and anything because you never know what you're going to be qualified for. There's a scholarship out there for everyone. I mean, I'm a twin, and there's a scholarship out there for twins. I always say, if you have a scholarship that's a left-handed violin player, and you're right-handed, apply for it. Or you play the cello, apply for it. What's the worst they're going to tell you? Is no. All right? There was a law, I always use it as an example, because there was a law firm in Westfield that was offering three $5,000 scholarships to anyone interested in engineering. They had one application. It was a business major. They awarded the $5,000 to them. Because they have that social responsibility to award those scholarships. So that's why I say apply for everything and anything. You just never know where you're going to be qualified for. So, yeah. So it's not so much the college. It's not so much the college. There's organizations out there. So anyone who is adopted, ward of the state, or, uh, or has court documents that they're actually emancipated from their, their parents, um, there are organizations out there that will pay for you to go to college. And I've, I, usually I get two or three students a year where they would come to Western New England with no tuition. Uh, they'll, they'll get the merit still, and then... The, this agency will pay for the rest, all right? Now, be careful, because a lot of those agencies will discourage you to look at private, and they'd rather you go to state because they don't want to pay cheaper. money. <laughs> so it's cheaper for them. That's not their choice. I mean, there's no, unless they have something specifically and say you have to go to state school, which most of them, they do not. They just say, if you go to college, we'll contribute to the tuition. And it's only for tuition. It doesn't include room and board. Um, I, there's been some exceptions to that rule, but it's very rare. I don't see it often. I think I've only seen it happen in two, year, two times in 17 years uh, where they covered room and board, too. But it was a lot of those were special circumstances, too. But there are, there are seriously agencies out there that will do that. Because especially with adoption, a lot of times, or if someone is, is a guardian, um, like uh, uh, instead of like a mom or dad doing that, like, you have a guardian, even if it's a relative and not a relative. The FAFSA doesn't really bring that in consideration because it's not fair for them to use the guardian information. So that's where you can actually say you're filing as an independent, and that's where you would need to provide the court documentation mm -hmm. to show that you're independent. Because whichever college you apply to with the FAFSA form, they're all going to be asking for that uh, documentation. Mm -hmm. So. That was a long answer to your question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's very detailed. I mean, financially, it's like the admissions process. Every single one of you is going to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis because everyone has a different family circumstance, a different situation. You can't compare because, I mean, it's very detailed what the FAFSA looks at. So that's why it's going to be different for all of you guys. So. Now, the one thing, too, that's part of the process are test scores, SATs or ACTs. However, we are a test-optional institution. We do not require them. We've been test-optional for eight years, all right? So the pandemic did not make us go test-optional. Our average SAT score is about a 1210, all right? I see the eyes went up. Same thing, it's an average. It is an average. <laughs> so we do count the highest evidence-based reading and writing math score. However, this is the biggest thing I get from students. How do I know whether I should go test-optional? Or if I go test-optional, Will that hurt my chances of not only being admitted, but merit money too? And the answer is we went test optional for a reason, to help you. All right? So let's say you're sitting, you got your GPA, and you took the SATs. <clears throat> if you're not sure what to do, let's have that conversation. I'll tell you where to go. All right? Because that one student, I got her decision done last night. She actually applied with her test scores. She hasn't submitted them yet. I started asking, I'm like, well, what are your test scores? What's your GPA? She shows me the transcript. I'm like, I'm switching you over. You're going test optional because she was going to get more merit money that way than she was with her SATs. But I also had another student yesterday where it was the opposite because of his GPA and how high his SAT scores were. I was like, you want to submit your scores because you're going to actually get a higher merit. So if you're not sure, we can have that conversation. I'll tell you which way to go. And even at the MCAC event, uh, event that we're going to be doing virtual, I do the same thing at that point. I'm like, all right, what are your SATs? Let me see your transcript. I say, all right, this is what we're going to do. And, um, and when I say we're truly test optional, we are test optional. All right. If you apply test optional and then we see your SAT scores, they are not taken in consideration. All right. Because there are some schools out there that say, oh, we're test optional. Oh, your SAT scores came in. We have to look at them. Then they're not test optional, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. All right. So we are truly, truly test optional. If you do decide to submit your SAT scores, my recommendation is go onto your College Board account, download the two page PDF file. All right. You can download your score report, email that to me, and I will accept that as your official. All right. 
Because if you pay college board, which I think is like $12 right now, they tell you it takes about two weeks for us to get the scores. It actually could take up to a month. All right? So we'll just take that score report and we'll be able to make a decision from there. Feel better about the SATs now? All right, good. <laughs> I'm hoping there's smiles underneath it. Um, the last thing we need to see is the essay. Now, the essay is topic of your choice. You guys can write about whatever you want. What's unique about you? What have you done that many students have done before? Maybe there was a certain event in your life that affected your grades that you want to share with me. All right? Whatever you want to write about, in the end, just make sure you're referring back to yourself. If you're writing about Aunt Susie, that's great, but I'm not trying to accept Aunt Susie. I'm trying to accept you. All right? So just make sure in the end you always bring it back to yourself. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. If you are strong academically, the essay may not have as much weight for you compared to someone that we could be worried about. All right? I'll still read it, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to have like, oh, we're putting 100% weight on this. Like, it could be a small amount. Can it still hurt you? Yes, and I'll mention how that will hurt you. All right? Because there's only four ways that will have it. But if you're a little bit weaker on the uh, academic side, but we see potential, that's where we can bring that essay in to help enhance it and say, all right, tell me something in that essay that I can't find in your application. But going back, like I said, there's four ways that the essay can truly hurt you, regardless of what your GPA looks like. And I mention these every year, and I still get students that will do one of these. One is if you plagiarize. All right, now you're writing about yourself. That should not happen. In 17 years, it has happened twice. Ironically, they were both from the same state. I'm just going to joke around. It was from New Jersey. That's her territory. So, <laughs> so um, that's a whole other story in itself. But anyway, don't do that. Second is don't write how much you like to do homework or go to school. I know you guys probably don't want to be here. Don't write about how you don't want to be here. I've actually had students who've done that. I've had students who write how they don't believe in doing homework. <laughs> I've had a student write about a chemistry teacher, how it ruined his four years. Now, the only way that would have held true, that chemistry teacher taught all his classes because they were actually lower than his chemistry class. <laughs> so I always say the accountability is on you. All right? It's not the teacher's fault. All right? So stay away from that. Third is some of you may have a first choice already. All right? We can have that conversation. You can tell me who your first choice is. I'll tell you who to go to speak to over there. But once you mention that in your essay that that school is your first choice, you're automatically denied, all right? Because you basically told me in your essay, if that school accepts you, you're going there. So why am I going to put you in your app, my, our application pool, all right? And last but not least, I blame your generation for this, all right? Don't send an essay like you're sending a text message. Actually, write why all you. Don't put you, don't put LOL, and don't put hashtags in your essay. I just didn't put three hashtags in our essay two years ago. I'm not kidding. This actually does happen. <laughs> don't use an iPad, all right, because I've had students who did that. We all know autocorrect comes into play, all right, or you're trying to figure out what the punctuations are and everything else. Like, stay away from that. If you need to use a computer, come on campus, I'll let you use one, all right? If you stay away from those four things, the essay cannot hurt you. It can only help you, okay? And we talked about the merit stuff and everything else, but that's the, oh, recommendation letters. We do not require them. <laughs> so if you want to submit them, any recommendation letters that are submitted will be taken in consideration. So make sure you write, find someone to write you a positive recommendation. All right, I've had a couple that were not. So, but if you decide not to submit a lot of recommendation, you will, that will not be held against you. All right. If I have all your materials and I'm missing recommendation letters, I'm starting to review your application. If it turns out I need them, then I'll make your file incomplete and then I'll request them. All right. Average I normally see is about two or three. Anything more than three, I get the point. The most I've ever received was eight. I'm stopping at three. You're wasting your time. So those five lovely people that wrote the recommendation letters for you, I'm not reading them. All right? Two or three. I would say three max. All right? But keep in mind, like I said, if you don't submit it, it's not going to be counted against you. Okay? Any questions about that? Five minutes? Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so any questions about that? Before I forget, because we're running a little out of time, I'm going to have Jasmine come around real quick just to hand my business card to you guys. If you have, and I'll stick behind for about five minutes too. If you have any specific questions, if you want more information, please, please reach out. All right? All right? I get a lot of students that say, well, I don't want to bother you. I say, bother the hell out of me. If you want to email me weekly, you email me weekly. All right? Because I like it when students ask questions because that's going to allow me to know that you're going to advocate for yourself on campus. All right? Because if you show up for class, you do the work, and you ask for help when you need it, you shouldn't have a problem. All right? But definitely come. I mean, like, even with engineering, I mean, Engineer, 100% internship placement rate, close to 100% job placement rate. We'll get you in and out four years compared to a school that has a five-year co-op program. All right? Even with criminal justice, I mean, we have students that will go into any of the government branches, uh, any of the acronyms, TSA, FBI, DEA, Secret Service. Like, they're going to those fields, or state local police officers, or even business. I mean, we have uh, only one or two schools in the Western Mass that actually have the highest accreditation in the College of Business, the same accreditation that Harvard and Yale has. All right? So... 
But the only way you're going to know that's better for you, because like I said, I can throw rankings. I can tell you all the opportunities we have is not to say we're better than other schools. It's just saying that you've got to figure out is that best for you. Mm-hmm. There's 4,400 colleges and universities out there. Each one has their own personality. You've got to figure out whether your personality matches that. And you're the only one. You guys are in control of this process, not us. We're trying to figure out how to advocate for you. We're trying to figure out how to accept you. Our goal is not to go in and say, oh, we're going to figure out how to deny you. Like, no, that's not the goal. Like, we want to work with you. If you're interested, let's see what we can do to help. So, mm-hmm. but I do appreciate you guys coming down. I really, oh, yes. I have a question about the campus. I want to know if, um, is, is diversity a big thing yeah, so we do like to celebrate diversity. So right now we're posting. Oh, I'll let her do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'll be honest with you. At first, I was a little bit like, eh, like I felt like um, I didn't see the diversity, but they are implementing like a lot of more clubs um, to be a part of. Like they do have like a you and me, which I, that one was probably one of like the awesomest clubs where truly everyone of diversity was there. Like, of, of all races, of all ethnicities, like, that's where everyone kind of came together, um, and they, they made events together, they planned stuff, like, we were able to just, like, come and make dinners, like, set up events where, like, everyone can come and, like, try different ethnic foods, you know, from different cultures, so I would say, from years prior, not so much, but as time has been going by, I would say, and, and with us reaching out into different locations, you know, with, within New England, our diversity has definitely increased a lot more. To give you guys an idea, when I came into college, so, and I'm dating myself since 1998, uh, we were 7%. Now we're at uh, 24%, and this incoming class was the largest percent of incoming class that we've had in school history. So we had a 20, 27% of the students that came in. And, and keep in mind, these are students that reported their race because you're not required to report it. So who knows? That number could be higher too. Right. So, but we do like to celebrate. We're, try, we're doing a lot more to, to celebrate diversity even more so than what we are. And like I said, with the programming um, that they do on campus, with the connection, uh, connection and, uh, connections and mentoring program, um, we're really trying to increase the, the uh, diversity. And, I mean, Dr. Um, Robert Johnson, who's our new president, he's, uh, he's African-American, so mm-hmm. um, our provost is Asian. So, I mean, we're really – our faculty and staff are really highly diverse, so – but we really – they always said if you can get to 25 percent, that's good. But that's not good for us, mm-hmm. all right? I mean, what would be nice is if we can get at least close to, like, half and half, yeah. to be honest. That's what we like. But in order for that to happen, there still need to be improvements. There still need to be changes. And we are implementing those changes – constantly to improve it so yeah and that's just us being transparent i don't want to say like oh yeah you're going to find everyone that looks like you no i mean it it all depends on how you perceive it but what i can say is the more involved you are the more you will see it right because if you just come on campus and you leave you may not see it as much because you commute it right yeah I do. yeah so <laughs> but i still saw it but yeah like being a commuter. It's, it's there um it's definitely there it's just yes you might have to look for it a little bit more so. It's, and it's mainly just because, you know, like, if you think about being comfortable, like, you're always comfortable with people who look like you, you know what I mean? So sometimes you may not realize, like, oh, yeah, like, all those people are just like me because you're on a different path, you know, or maybe you're in a completely different major that a lot of people don't go into, you know what I mean, of people of minority. Um, but it definitely has gotten better. And then the school has also switched over, right, from, I think it was, it was like, private for-profit to not. Oh, no, no, we've always been not-for-profit. Well, no, but something happened we started... Something else happened. Where it basically we'll figure it out. I can't remember exactly what it was called, but they started um, like a lot more students of minorities started actually just applying, you know, to the school. Like it, maybe it was just because of out, more outreach and more connecting, you know, with other different schools and other different areas. I remember. Um, yeah. But <laughs> I would say for me, like I had fun, and I'm Hispanic, I'm Puerto Rican. I, like I said, I came from here, so it was a little scary at first, you know, to kind of come from bunch of people that look like you you know and then going into like a different situation where it's like okay like I kind of feel by myself you know but that's also an advantage in a way you know because you're, you're, you're that different person and you can really stand out and really show yourself you know especially within your environment and we I mean back in the day we had a diversity scholarship too that they rescinded but I know I've been talking to our United Mutual Equal um, I mean even our sports are our, our, um, Student Athletic Advisory Committee, they branched off a diversity committee, too, for student athletes. So, like I said, it's all the stuff that we're looking to do. But um, I've been trying to help them out as far as, like, potentially implementing that back again. Um, when that's going to happen, I don't know. Um, but it, there's discussion. I mean, we're always trying to find ways to improve. Because I look at this one, nothing's ever perfect. 
So I don't believe in perfection, to be honest. <laughs> I feel there's always room for improvement, in my opinion. So. Iman, Imani, right? Yeah. I just wanted to say about your question about how you're not too sure about the criminal justice. Sometimes, like, your first year, even in general, in, in any major, like, you really don't get into the, the nitty-gritty all the time. Sometimes you're just kind of in, like, your basic yeah. general courses, getting to know the information, getting to know the major, and then after, you know, m maybe your sophomore year or your junior year is when you start getting into the real concentration of what you're going to do. So you always have the option to move around and switch around and take other classes of different interests. You're never just specifically labeled on one spot. Kathy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And some work better than others. So, like, for engineering, I don't see a lot of double majoring in engineering because the way your curriculum is set up, like, unless you want to stay for five, six years, that's fine. So, I have only saw one engineering student who's ever – actually, he didn't double major. He triple majored in Ooh. biomedical engineering, biology, and chemistry. Oh so, um, but, like, criminal justice one where I, I do see double majors, marketing, sport management, accounting, and finance. Like, so some do – now, granted, if you have certain majors that will be a little bit more challenging, we do have what we call an integrated little more studies program where you take two majors and you combine them together, but you can't do that until you're on campus because you have to get approval to do that. So, Any other questions? You guys feel good? Okay, good. I don't see anyone crying, so that's actually a good thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Oh, no, there's a thumbs up. All right. <laughs> so, well, we do appreciate you guys coming down, honestly. Um, like I said, this is much better than doing it in front of a computer, even though she's in front of the computer. <laughs> I'm just picking on her. Um, but, yeah, if you guys need anything right now, um, feel free to reach out, okay? All right, enjoy the rest of school, guys. Have a Thank good day. you.